Good afternoon. My name is Michaela O'Brien, and I will be your moderator for this workshop. Welcome to the workshop, Strive to Thrive, Protect Your Health After a Transplant Using Your Own Cells. It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's speakers, Dr. Patrick Johnson and Dr. Cecilia Merrigan. Dr. Johnson is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a consultant in the Division of Hematology at Mayo Clinic. He specializes in stem cell transplantation and CAR T cell therapy, and his research focuses on novel agents to treat lymphoma, such as vaccines and biologic therapies. Dr. Merrigan is a nurse practitioner who specializes in the care of patients with lymphoma at Mayo Clinic. She has been involved in the survivorship program at Mayo Clinic and has a special interest in assisting patients with their recovery after a stem cell transplant. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson and Dr. Merrigan. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am Dr. Patrick Johnston. And I'm Cecilia Merrigan. And we're here to talk to you about survivorship issues after an autologous stem cell transplant. These are our learning objectives. Uh, we'll be going over some late complications that may develop after you undergo an autologous stem cell transplant, uh, and then risk factors for each complication and ways that you can help uh, minimize the risk and work with any complications that may occur. You know, after transplant, you normally would come back for a three month visit, so the first 100 days, your blood counts are returning to normal. We're watching for infections. You're trying to regain your strength. So every day, performing a little more activity. You're trying to maintain your weight and your physical strength and trying to manage any side effects that are lingering after the transplant. Once we get out of that initial phase after a transplant, we're looking at how we can begin striving after our transplant. So at six months post-transplant, we'll, we will start the revaccination process, which you guys may have heard about um, revaccinating all your childhood immunizations at this time. Um, we'll also be continuing with regaining your physical recovery, meaning increasing your ability to do things you enjoyed prior to your transplant by increasing your ability to continue with activity, increasing your level of activity and those things together will help decrease your fatigue as well. And then finally, we'll transition into looking at um, how we can recover mentally from the transplant process and the, the chemotherapy prior to that. Um, that can be done with support groups, individualized therapy with a talk therapist, as well as utilization of medications uh, and looking at quote, brain fog recovery, which generally in, improves over time as you continue to be more active. What about the first year? So we're looking at immunity. So during the transplant, you get chemotherapy, and this lowers your immunity. And therefore, as Cecilia had mentioned, you will want to be revaccinated. One point of note, um, the influenza vaccine and the uh, COVID-19 vaccination series are repeated usually earlier than that six month beginning st start point. And then often people ask about how good is my immunity? When is my immunity back to normal? Um, and I kind of look at that on a continuum with your immunity being at its lowest during the transplant and then each time you, uh, each month that goes by, uh, your immunity improves. Um, and so when we look at you as a whole person outside of just your immunity, we're looking at how do we thrive uh, and help support you thrive into a more normal pace of life. Um, and so you're gonna be at the center of the group of people that can help you thrive from here. So you'll have a, a group of people that includes your primary care provider, which will provide you with support to help you thrive. Obviously your cancer provider, whether that be a hematologist or an oncologist. Um, 
any subspecialty providers with any complications that may occur to help support you. And then obviously your support system is uh, important during this time as it has been throughout transplant. What about you? What can you do? You can make healthy food choices, fruits, veggies, whole grains, proteins, um, try and minimize processed food. Um, try and look for a calcium and vitamin D rich diet. We often see lower calcium and vitamin D in our patients. I encourage my patients to try and increase their activity level every day, going out even beyond the year. So exercise, whether that be walking, you know, on a regular basis, participating in weight bearing exercise or other activities such as biking, uh, rowing, et cetera. Also, it's important to have good stress management, um, whether that involves meditation, um, other activities, mindfulness, or possibly even involving a therapist, and remembering how important sleep is for your recovery. A common question that comes up after uh transplant is what are my risks for getting other types of cancers? So here we have it broken down um, so you can kind of see what the potential, um, these are, excuse me, these are the other areas that may be increased secondary risk depending on what your pre-transplant treatment and post-transplant treatment may have been um, and some ways to help decrease the risk of these despite uh, what has happened in the past. So looking at skin cancer risk, we recommend a yearly evaluation by your dermatologist to remove any suspicious lesions to identify those quickly. And then always using sunscreen when out in the sun, hats, sunglasses. Looking for secondary risk of uh, leukemias, would, we would recommend continuing with yearly blood counts that can be done by your primary care provider or uh, your hematologist, oncologist. And then generally looking at healthy lifestyle um, to help any, decrease any secondary cancer risk within the liver and limiting alcohol use. And then oral and cervical cancer risks, really the best thing to do uh, is get your HPV vaccines, which um, will, is part of the post-transplant uh, reimmunizations, um, maintaining pap smears regularly um, for your primary care provider, and then um, breast cancer screening finally. Would, we would recommend a yearly mammogram starting at the age of 40 um, or at age 30 or eight years after radiation, whichever one is first if you have any radiation to the chest area. You also should undergo standard cancer screening, such as colon, which the starting age is at age 45 and every five years following that. If you have a family history of colon cancer, that may indicate for earlier screening, often three to five years earlier than the youngest family member who has been diagnosed with colon cancer. As well with prostate cancer, you really should discuss with your primary care provider you should have a yearly prostate exam and possibly PSA screening. So now we're gonna move away from um, cancer screenings and look at heart health overall, which we've discussed exercise. Um, the goal to help with increasing your heart health would be getting 30 minutes of exercise daily, five days a week. Um, and it, But you can start wherever you're at. If it's five days, five minutes a, a day, uh, and then increasing it gradually to have that goal. Also, we already talked about whole foods, but also portion control is important and that's just to generally help maintain a healthy weight. And then the screenings, which are done by your primary care provider, typically um, on a semi-regular, if not annual basis, depending on your age, we would recommend cholesterol and blood sugar screenings to make sure you don't have any high cholesterol or diabetes and then maintaining a normal blood pressure. Your risks really for heart health decrease in function would be if you had any anthracycline 
uh, exposure in your chemotherapy. You may recall that's typically a red uh, chemotherapy infusion. Um, and you can ask your oncologist if, if you had been exposed to that medication. And then obviously radiation to the chest as well. What about lung health? We know that you can develop inflammation of the lungs, which you may hear from your doctor as pneumonitis. The risk factors for this include chest radiation that involves the lungs, bleomycin exposure, higher doses of transplant chemotherapy, such as BCNU, and also if you're at a younger age when you undergo transplant. Uh, so how can we work with those risk factors and help you thrive through that? Um, it's important that we maintain our vaccinations um, kind of throughout life. Uh, so we would recommend the pneumococcal influenza annual, COVID annual, or however often it has, will come out in the future. Uh, and then a newer vaccine this year, as far as in this age population, would be um, RSV in anyone greater than 60 years of age. Um, imaging really is going to be an individual decision and discussion between you and your primary care provider typically, and that's going to take into factors such as if you have used tobacco or uh, currently used tobacco um, on if any imaging is really warranted. Um, and then obviously what helps your heart helps your lungs, so exercise will help with your lung health overall. What about your bone health? We know that there are certain risk factors that affect your potential for developing osteoporosis or osteopenia. These include having a sedentary lifestyle, having early onset menopause, having certain rheumatologic conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis, having prolonged steroid use we know can damage bones. Being a female puts you at risk, as well as if you are a smoker, either past or present. And how we can reduce the risk uh, or the negative effects to bone health. Um, again, that exercise is coming up, but specifically resistance training. So if you think using um, resistance bands, weights, things that help actually your muscles contract and maintain a contraction um, helps with that overall bone health as well. Calcium and vitamin D, just having a, a diet rich in that uh, is what's currently recommended. There's, unless you've been identified with a, a true deficiency by one of your providers, there's no current recommendation on uh, supplementation um, of that outside of a, a diet rich in those minerals. Um, and then finally, bone density scanning. The current recommendation for that would be to start at the age of 65 for women um, and at the age of 70 for men. You would discuss this with your primary care provider as well. What about your nerve health? What is your risk of developing nerve damage, whether transient or permanent? There are some risk factors, certain chemotherapeutic agents, such as vinca alkaloids, which are derived from the vinca vine, the flowers that you might plant in the spring. Um, also, certain drugs that are used for multiple myeloma, but also myeloma itself can have amyloid deposits that cause some level of neuropathy. So... This area of your health overall can be a challenge depending on um, the factors that brought you to this point with your nerve health and if you have any neuropathy symptoms. However, there are things that can be done. Um, certainly, if you have a multiple myeloma, getting good disease control and managing that will help decrease um, some of those symptoms. Medications, uh, some patients benefit from different types of medications like gabapentin or pregabalin, and those can be worked with your primary care provider to help provide you some relief of, of the dumbness or tingling that you may be experiencing. Certainly physical therapy can help depending on the cause of your peripheral neuropathy and something you could discuss with your primary care provider. Wearing loose fitting clothing, um, also tends to 
help minimize the peripheral neuropathy symptoms you may have. In addition, compression stockings, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, could, could be beneficial. It's really going to be something that you have to individualize and see what works best for you. Um, and then kind of alternative options would be uh, acupuncture and exploring that as an option of benefit for you and warm foot baths. What about your immune health? We know that there are certain risk factors that may result in decreased immunity. These include having had a prior splenectomy. Um, if you've had prior CAR T cell therapy, we know that that results in lowered immunity, as well as if you're a person of advanced age, your immunity drops as we age. So supporting your immune health um, would be starting that revaccination process. And there's just a little schematic there to see that essentially you're going to get four rounds of immunizations starting at approximately six months with the caveat being uh, COVID and influenza immunizations, depending on the time of year. Um, things to uh, bear in mind uh, with vaccinations in general kind of moving forward in your life and as you get further away from transplant is that you're still going to want to discuss any live vaccine um, before getting it with your oncologist or hematologist to make sure it's safe for you. What about sexual health? We know there are certain factors that affect fertility or sexual function. These include certain chemotherapeutic agents, um, whether you have anxiety or depression developing before, during, or after your transplant. Also, there is decreased fertility as a function of age. So when we look at how we can assist uh, with sexual, sexual functioning after transplant, we're really going to be looking at three different areas of possibility of health. The first would be a sexual health specialist, um, and that would is two different types of providers. One could be a women's health specialist or a urologist if you're a male, as well as sex therapists. Um, some medications can be beneficial depending on the cause of your sexual uh, dysfunction, if that's the worry there. Um, and so, so some things to keep in mind would be um, erectile dysfunction medications that are available if the issue is vaginal dryness, there are some treatments for that that can be worked with your primary care provider. And if it's uh, anxiety or depression related, certainly there are medications and therapies offered to help uh, manage in that area. So it's really gonna be important that you be honest and upfront with your primary care providers uh, about any concerns you may have with sexual function to really get to the root cause so that a, an effective treatment can can be started for you. And then finally, hormone uh, level. This is most important in uh, women that become uh, menopausal after their transplant. Um, and it may be worth talking to a gynecologist about if hormone replacement is helpful for you if you're going through menopause before the age of 50. How can we thrive with regards to sexual health? You know, you want to have planning before the transplant. And so often there's a discussion of sperm banking or possible um, cryopreservation. cryopreservation. Um, and then after the transplant, we usually want patients to be disease-free for two years before attempting to conceive. Um, I always remark to my male patients, do not assume that a transplant is effective means of birth control. If you're not trying to become pregnant, it's important to continue using birth control devices such as condoms. And if you've had a prior anthracycline, it may be important to consult with a cardiologist to see if more testing is warranted to make sure that you have the, the heart strength to go through this. Now, when you do choose to um, attempt to conceive, you 
often will be referred to a fertility specialist. And if um, natural methods are not working, consideration can be given for in vitro fertilization. Now switching topics somewhat is we're gonna look at your overall mental health. Um, certainly going through a transplant is a very difficult process in a lot of ways. Um, but what I hear a lot from patients and you may uh, understand yourself and have experienced yourself is that when you're going through the transplant, you're, you feel like you're in a tunnel and there's just the next appointment, next thing to do, and you don't necessarily fully grasp the, the situation that you're, you're living through. So now that we're on the other side of the transplant, some patients then start to feel that anxiety, the fear of reoccurrence, depression, depressive symptoms, or even post-trauma symptoms. Um, those can occur uh, more often in transitions of care. So meaning, like I said, after the transplant, when you're moving to a new phase, uh, you're not seeing your, your oncology or hematology team quite as much. Um, people, when you're fatigued and have lack of sleep or insomnia, that can certainly worsen our overall mental health. Um, and then just based on the statistics, if you're male or younger or older, you're at higher risk for things like anxiety and depression after a transplant. And then if you had previous trauma prior to going through the transplant as well. How can we thrive to improve our mental health? Well, there is cognitive behavioral therapy, which often is utilizing a therapist. Um, there are medications that can be used. We know there are anti-anxiety medications, anti-depression medications, et cetera. It's always important if you're a spiritual person to utilize the spiritual support you have available. Some, some patients actually find that journaling is important to show their experience, their journey. Um, I personally like mindfulness as a technique for being living in the moment. Um, there are many different publications and online tutorials on mindfulness. As well, exercise is very important. We know that this improves mental health. Um, so as for your heart and lungs, it's also good for your mind. And so we just want to show you uh, one area that if you feel like you have become uh, in crisis with your mental health and you feel like you'd be better off not have being alive or you have those thoughts, there is immediate help out there. Uh, we just wanted to share this so that you had it. First, you, please know that you're not alone. This is the actual number, you can call 988 uh, and there will be someone available like when calling 911 um, to help you if you are in crisis like that. Certainly if you have symptoms of um, anxiety or depression that lasts for two or more weeks, the first step would be to reach out to your primary care provider as well, unless you're in that crisis mode. What about your cognitive function? We know that certain things will affect your memory or other cognitive activities. These risk factors include advanced age. We know that there is also medication side effects that can affect your mind. If you're fatigued, you're definitely going to have more difficulty with cognitive function. Again, anxiety and depression often affect the, the ability for memories, um, other cognitive activities. And then if you have certain dietary deficiencies, certain vitamin or mineral deficiencies, this can definitely affect your ability to think. And so moving um, beyond the cognitive difficulties that may have occurred during transplant, we look at different kind of cogs that we can control to help improve uh, that functioning. So certainly your primary care provider, and we've talked about your primary care provider a lot, they're really um, kind of jack of all trades that can help with many different aspects of your overall health and are an important part of your, your care team. 
Um, so being upfront about any concerns you may have, they can look at, again, the root cause, if, it's, if there's any other actionable item that can occur, like replacing some of your vitamin deficiencies if they, if they are present. Certainly, if you're having difficulty sleeping, working with someone in, within sleep medicine can be beneficial to help improve your quality of sleep, which will improve your cognitive function. And depending on the level of impairment, even occupational therapy or occupational um, health specialists can help with giving different strategies and improving that cognitive function over time. Um, in a more uh, prescriptive way than, than can be done at home alone. Always remember the support you have around you. You know, when you went through transplant, you often were required to have a caregiver at all times if you were in an outpatient transplant setting. But post-transplant, it's still important to have those caregiver resources. Um, we know that anxiety and depression can occur in both you as well as caregivers. There's also the financial stress that occurs with a transplant. Remember though, you matter too. Both you and the caregiver are important. And as a, as a matter of fact, whenever I see one of my post-transplant patients, I look at their caregiver and ask, how are you? Now, there are risk factors that can affect things. You know, what is your employment status? Going through transplant may affect your ability to um, regain your prior employment. Um, if you have prior mental health concerns, that can be um, exacerbated after going through transplant. And if you have a lack of a support network, these greatly increase your risk factors. So it's important to have those caregiver resources present. And then kind of looking at how the interplay, like Dr. Johnston said, um, between both the support person or persons and the actual patient going through the transplant, the support person matters in the context of they help support the patient through transplant. So if they're not healthy and thriving, it's difficult to improve the quality of life and uh, health of the person going through the transplant. So we want to look at the success of the whole unit, uh, both you and your support person. And so things like looking outside of the transplant for that support person um, is important so that they can kind of regain a little bit of the control they likely felt like they had lost during the transplant time. So getting back involved in um, prior interests or work or staying involved in that during this time. Looking at your lifestyle, are there things that can be tweaked similar to what we mentioned before? Can we add in a little exercise? Is there a moment for mindfulness throughout your day? Looking at strategies that work for you. Um, and then considering if, if therapy would be helpful to help you process through uh, everything that you've gone through. And then for the support person in general, having some time alone just to be by themselves, not having to care for someone um, can be really helpful in uh, their overall success. And now with regards to resources, there's a huge wealth of information out there as well as um, financial support that can be obtained uh, both during and after transplant. Um, these include the EMT InfoNet, which is sponsoring this activity. Um, there's the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. For those with lymphoma, the Lymphoma Research Foundation has huge resources. Um, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine, um, very useful from the NIH, looking at what has been proven to be a benefit, as well as things that have been tested that really have no activity to benefit patients in this post-transplant setting. Um, we do have our Mayo Clinic website that has a lot of information. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, again, is very um, helpful 
for patients with those disorders. The International Myeloma Foundation, um, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, and the NBMT link, the National Bone Marrow Transplant link. All of these have a wealth of information that you should utilize those resources if you need. And these are just our references. Um, we will stop here. Thank you so much for your attention and allowing us to speak with you today. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. And I'm, I'd like to thank BMT InfoNet for inviting us to speak. And I, I want to thank all of the patients and caregivers for their time and energy making it through transplant. And hopefully this will help you live many years very healthy after that event. Thank you, Drs. Johnson and Merrigan, for this excellent presentation. We will now begin the Q&A session of this presentation. If you do have a question, please use the chat box on the lower left side of the screen to submit your question. We will answer as many questions as possible. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, does treatment accelerate ailments in the body? Does treatment have an effect on the body orthopedically? And the final, those two questions. Sure, so I guess I'll go first. This is Patrick again. So can treatment accelerate ailments in the body? Well, yeah, of course. So not just the fact of going through transplant, but also relying on the treatment you had prior to transplant. So, you know, we know that even with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, that can, this can affect your thyroid function. You can, we know that patients over the age of 65, normally about one in four have low thyroid function, but after transplant, that comes on quite frequently earlier. And so with that being said, you may need, I, I actually check thyroid function testing yearly on patients after transplant in case they need that supplement. Um, can it affect your bones? Yes, of course. You know, many times going through transplant, you know, we talked about if your lungs get affected and you have pneumonitis and you get placed on a longer course of steroids to treat that. Well, steroids affect bone health and can accelerate that. Also, some of the diseases can affect bone health, including myeloma. So it's important, you know, what do I stress? You know, I'm really big on getting my patients to exercise. I remind them that, you know, weight-bearing exercise will improve your bone strength and health. And also, you need to work with your transplant physician, your primary hemoc doctor, and your primary care to see if you're developing osteopenia or osteoporosis and what you can do to intervene on that. Hopefully this answered your question. Okay, is breast cancer post-transplant a typical condition after three or more years after transplant? Thanks for the question. Um, so this is a question that kind of needs to take into context the exact treatment that went into not just transplant, but more typically uh, radiation that was uh, affecting any sort of breast tissue. Um, so I would say typically, you know, just looking at you as a whole person, having had a type of cancer, you're genetically at slightly higher risk for other types of cancers, um, not just specifically breast cancer. But the general guideline, if you had no radiation, is still the same um, as far as mam mammography and breast examinations and following up with your family medicine provider um, because the risk is generally the same as, as the general population. However, that, there is a caveat there in that if you had radiation, your risk um, for breast cancer increases, but it's typically around eight years after um, the radiation exposure. So three years would be quite short um, interval. Um, and if there are concerns, I, I would recommend kind of following up with your provider on exactly the, the type of treatment you had and if there's any specific um, 
treatment that, that would increase your risk specifically. I hope that answers the, the question. Great. If my immunity hasn't recovered in two to three years, can it still recover? I have low IgG. Yeah, so that's actually a great question. So the first thing I'm going to stress is that your immunity is not only related to antibodies, so reflected by your immunoglobulins like IgG, but also is reflected or is also composed of your T cell immunity. And so what I do stress to my own patients is, you know, I don't only focus on the number, the IgG level, but I also look at, you know, are they having frequent infections? If they are, and especially if they're serious infections, then they may need supplementation with pooled immunoglobulins, often called IVIG. Um, can your immune system recover beyond the three-year point? Sure, it may take a while. It may actually, you know, realize that when you get an infection, you trigger an immune response. When you're being vaccinated, you're triggering an immune response. Now, this being said, you know, some of our patients will have had a transplant and CAR T cell therapy or chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy, which are the genetically modified cells to target tumor cells. Now, we do know that when you undergo both of these, your immune system is going to be stunted even more, and it, it may take several years for this to recover. There is still the potential for recovery. Now, if we're not seeing recovery after a period of time, there are times where we would perform a bone marrow biopsy to make sure that there's no evidence of any underlying chromosomal damage that may be resulting in this. Or are there other conditions that are, you know, reducing your ability to, you know, manifest an immune response, such as, you know, so I'm going to give an example. I am a lymphoma specialist, and with certain types of lymphoma, we will give a maintenance antibody therapy after the transplant, so in particular mantle cell lymphoma, and that will delay the ability to redevelop an immune response. Um, so I Hopefully that answered your question, but yes, there is still the potential for regaining immunity. Okay, this patient asked, after having an auto stem cell transplant, how often should I undergo or follow up with bone marrow biopsies, PET scans, and standard blood work? Yeah, that's a very good question. So some of it will be specific to what drove the decision to move forward with a autologous stem cell transplant. There's no um, kind of generalized, um, as far as, uh, I'll break this down, to, to the, a bone marrow biopsy after um, transplant. So for, again, we're, we're lymphoma specialists, so just as an example, um, if there was no involvement in the bone marrow prior to the transplant of uh, the lymphoma, we actually don't typically repeat the bone marrow biopsy unless there's another reason to do it, like Dr. Johnston was just mentioning. Um, and then kind of looking at lab work, that also is a little bit dependent on um, the disease that brought you to the point of needing a transplant. I would say it, generally once you're past that, first year, we'll just say, and you've had count recovery, um, typically we would recommend every time you're going in for follow-up uh, as planned with your hematologist, oncologist, so about every four to six months at that point. Once you get to about five years post your transplant, then really the recommendation for lab routine lab work is just annually. So when you would go in for your general physical, um, kind of seeing where your blood counts are, at that time. Uh, and then I think finally the last part of that question was imaging. Again, that, that, that depends on the type of uh, disorder or disease that brought you to the transplant. Um, kind of generally speaking, it's a little bit up to debate and up to provider discretion as well as discussions with you as the patient on um, the routineness of imaging, um, specifically for lymphoma, we 
tend to repeat imaging um, depending on the type of lymphoma um, every six months for the first year and then annually thereafter. But if at two years you're doing well, then we tend to stop. Um, but that could be different if, if um, it's, you know, CLL was your disease that brought you to a transplant or something of that nature where your disease wasn't um, manifesting within scans. Um, so a, kind of a broad contextual answer, but kind of generally speaking, se several months between, if not annually for scans, perhaps um, once for bone marrow, depending, and then uh, eventually getting to the annual uh, lab work. The next patient wants to know, what are treatment options for somebody whose blood counts haven't recovered to a normal range post-transplant? What do you suggest? So I think first you need to figure out what the underlying reason is for the lack of cellular recovery. Um, there, it, it's not infrequent to look at any comorbidities to see if somebody has, for example, if they developed kidney injury and remembering the kidneys produce the small protein that stimulates the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. And so that level may be low in the blood and we may need to supplement with recombinant erythropoietin. There are times where for some reason the white blood cell count just is not rising as it should despite having a normal starting component in the bone marrow, and we have to give agents to stimulate that, such as, such as Neupogen. Um, there are other times where simply the platelets don't recover, and we need to, again, provide one of these agents that can help increase the platelet level, and I, I've seen patients where all of three of these are required. Now, if all three levels are remaining low, that may be due to some complication during the transplant that stunted the ability of the stem cells to go to their, their normal niche and start producing more cells. And so there are times if we have additional stem cells, so for instance, with patients with myeloma at Mayo Clinic, we often collect for two or three transplants, so enough cells, and there are times where we give a cellular boost. Now, on the other hand, if we find out that there is a clonal problem with a stem cell, such as cytogenetic abnormalities that are limiting the ability, then there are times we have to look at other treatments, such as the other type of transplant utilizing somebody else's stem cells to repopulate the marrow. Okay. Um, can anything be prescribed for an energy uptick? I'm extremely fatigued and it affects our quality of life. Yeah, this is uh, a common um, issue after transplant um, and one that isn't easily uh, answered, I would say. Um, kind of looking at, I always harp on the idea of, you know, looking at the root cause of why the fatigue is there. Now, certainly it's most likely related to having gone through a transplant and still recovering from that entire process, but making sure that we meet with our family medicine providers or primary care providers to discuss the fatigue and, and really look into, is there something else that's contributing to this, um, such as an underfunctioning thyroid or um, you're not eating enough or you're not unable to sleep at night? Um, as far as a, a, a prescription goes, certainly if there was an issue that was contributing to it, we, would, we could prescribe whatever treatment would be appropriate for the underlying cause. Now, to say that we've maybe excluded all of those things and truly it's fatigue from the transplant, there's nothing else actionable for us to help improve Really, there's no specific treatment or prescription that can improve fatigue. Um, it's really going to be taking a look at your 
whole lifestyle, you're holistically treating you as a person. So getting that um, activity in is crucial to helping with fatigue. Multiple studies have looked at this uh, problem and the only thing that we have found, well, the, the thing that has been most successful, I should say, has been maintaining activity while you're going through transplant and then continuing to have exercise or activity of some kind um, that you find enjoyable uh, after transplant and then slowly increasing that in increments until the the fatigue improves. Another thing um, to, to consider is if for uh, females, if you have gone through menopause, certainly there may be a component uh, of fatigue that is compounded from having gone through menopause from either the transplant process or previous treatments. Um, and that's uh, a point that you could discuss with a gynecologist on if perhaps a little bit of hormone replacement therapy m may be beneficial um, to, to that as well. You know, and just to add on to that, you know, I think incorporating rest through the day can be important. And I'm going to give you an extreme example. I have a patient who is turning 90 um, who had his transplant when he was around 75 and his wife, I'm, you know, they lived here in town. And so his wife continually will say he's very tired. But when I see him, he's actually quite energetic, but then he incorporates rest during the day. And that actually improves his activity level in bursts. And as Cecilia said, you know, incorporating some form of exercise, whether that be walking, um, you know, dental cycling, you know, these things can actually improve your fatigue level. So, I, you know, incorporating rest and exercise may benefit you. Thanks. Is there any clinical data or research studies to suggest that it's beneficial for myeloma patients to take calcium supplements to help with bone repair while disease is under control? So I think it's important to discuss that with your uh, myeloma doctor um, because, you know, we don't want to get into a scenario of hypercalcemia. Um, they often will want to know what your vitamin D levels are as well as calcium uh, current levels. Um, you also realize that, you know, bone repair um, with osteoblasts, um, you know, do require calcium to, you know, reform the, the good bone. And so you do require some calcium, but you also don't want to overdo it. Okay. Somebody asked, since one... Some, one's immune system is affected at stem cell transplant. Does this include all the viruses contracted during one's life so that there's an increase for colds for years following a stem cell transplant? So the, I think the question's getting at um, how much of your antibody levels are actually maintained throughout the transplant process. So um, you had, we often think of newborn babies or within the first year of life, it's not uncommon for infants to get, you know, in the teens levels of cold um, from picking up all the viruses because they have absolutely no immunity when, when they're born or very little. Um, I would say that, you know, not quite the same for adults that, or younger um, individuals that go through transplant uh, in that you don't, we don't totally wipe out all of your immunity. We take away, a, I would say, a large majority of it, and that's the reason that the revaccinations are necessary so that we can help protect you. But again, kind of looking at your overall immunity, it's not just your antibody levels that that um, provide you protection. Uh, Dr. Johnson mentioned T cells, so those are kind of the, the cells in your body that run around your bloodstream and, and surveil for viruses and things, and actually um, they attack and kill viruses on their own without the use of antibodies. So that number uh, and the functioning of those cells is still present, um, 
you know, kind of talking months to years after transplant. So I would say, you know, in short, the answer is generally no. However, given the caveat, if you are experiencing multiple infections, it's good to kind of have a more thorough evaluation of your immune system with a more granular look at what are your antibody levels, what are your T cell levels, and um, is there an actionable item like what Dr. Johnston mentioned before with IVIG where we can actually infuse antibodies into you um, to help bulk up your immune system and and help protect against viruses and uh, these cold symptoms or illnesses, I should say. Is there a particular reason why a multiple myeloma patient can only have a maximum of two transplants? Well, there, there's no, there's not any data to say why, you know, two is a magic number. Um, realize that we're always trying to optimize the therapy for each disease type. And as you may realize, um, there are several new lines of therapy that have evolved since the development of transplant for multiple myeloma, including the multiple CAR T cell therapies that have been approved, as well as now several bispecific and bite antibodies um, that are in clinical practice. And so what usually the physician or transplanter or cellular therapist is trying to do is trying to utilize the tools we have to get the best result, to provide the best and longest quality of life possible. Okay. Um, this person is having an issue with recurrent vomiting after a transplant in 2022. Could this be a side effect of an autologous transplant? So I would need to know a little bit more to be able to kind of say exactly for this patient, but kind of broadly speaking, um, having had a transplant two years prior, the likelihood that uh, the transplant is causing intractable nausea and vomiting at this point, I think uh, is generally low. Um, that would be something that we would generally consider more commonly in the acute phase or right after the transplant, uh, right after you've had that chemotherapy uh, as a side effect from, from that. Um, at the time. At this point, I, it, it would be prudent to, to look at other causes. Certainly, the transplant process can be difficult. Specifically, the chemotherapy can be difficult on the GI tract. Um, but several years later, I would have expected the uh, GI tract to have healed from any potential uh, disturbance that was caused by the chemotherapy as part of the transplant process. So uh, looking at other potential causes um, and having a discussion uh, with your provider uh, regarding your symptoms seems, seems reasonable. Does the L-glutamine taken before the transplant help with GI issues? Is there a study that might suggest that this is true? You know, I don't really know of any study that um, would suggest that L-glutamine would uh, improve the GI health to prevent GI issues going through transplant. Now, that being said, that's one reason to utilize the National Cancer Institute complementary and alternative website to see if any studies have been done on this, you know, because different groups are always looking at, you know, will this supplement improve things, you know? Currently at the Mayo Clinic, we have a clinical trial in lymphoma patients, whether or not um, magnesium supplementation, either topical or oral, may be a benefit to patients. And so, you know, it's only by doing these clinical trials that we will know, but I do not personally know of any trial that has shown L-glutamine to be a benefit. So. Okay. In your opinion, what's the likelihood and timing of secondary cancers after a stem cell transplant? So, 
timing of secondary potential cancers and the actual overall risk uh, is certainly dependent on a, a few factors. One would be kind of your familial history of, of a secondary uh, cancer, um, what type of treatment you got pre, during, and post-transplant, um, and your other general kind of your genetic profile and your lifestyle um, choices and, and any modifications you may have made to improve your, your lifestyle post-transplant. So uh, there isn't one kind of at X amount of years, this is your highest risk for um, getting a secondary malignancy. Um, I would say, generally speaking, kind of looking at the data that I've looked at at um, different exposure risks, kind of the 8 to 12 year mark is uh, just to give you kind of a general idea. It's not, it's not kind of immediately after. Typically, if there is a secondary malignancy that's going to occur, uh, it tends to be quite a few years after the transplant. It's not typically something that's immediate. And so that's why it's important to really, even if you, quote, unquote, graduate from um, your hematologist or oncologist and you're not following with them regularly any longer because you're cancer-free and you've, you've uh, recovered um, elsewise, uh, elsewise uh, in your um, transplant and cancer, to, to continue following with your primary care provider or your uh, family medicine provider um, to, to maintain those cancer screenings, that's going to be the biggest um, determinant in, in finding these things early if, if they are going to occur. Um, so that would be the, the biggest point is to just maintain a, a nice, healthy relationship with your primary care provider to so these things could be caught early if if they are going to occur. Okay, looks like we're running out of time. So we're, we've got one more question to ask this, for this workshop. This person had an autologous transplant two years ago for an autoimmune disease, disease myasthenia gravis, and they have now relapsed and also developed Graves' disease. They want to know how they can improve their immune system functioning and to try to avoid further autoimmune dysfunction. That, that is a rather complex question. Um, I, I'm really sorry that the autoimmune condition has returned. Um, we do know that with transplant, we're, our, part of what we're doing is resetting the immune system, the innate immune system. And unfortunately, we can develop both good immunity as well as bad problems, such as where you develop other autoimmune conditions. Um, I, I really think working with your, um, I'm assuming you're working with a rheumatologist as well as their discussion with the transplant group as to what can be done to try and improve your immune health. So I'm, I'm and just, sorry if uh, that doesn't. Yeah, and to add yeah, perhaps maybe an immunologist, um, depending on since it's you know, a myasthenia or an endocrinologist, um, depending, you know, on kind of the, the overall picture if someone else is having a similar issue. On behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, I'd like to thank Dr. Johnson and Dr. Merrigan for a very helpful presentation, and thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions. Please contact BMT InfoNet if we can help you in any way, and enjoy the rest of the symposium.